Because one of the problems we have is, is the control of television, the control of the media, the <coughs> alliance between government and, and journalism, you know, when a war comes along. Uh, we saw this during the Gulf War. But at the same time, one of the things that's happening in this country is the building up of a kind of, uh, you know, underground of radio stations and cable stations and even computer networks uh, with, uh, which enable people to communicate with one another, trying, trying to use the new technology uh, uh, against the, the people who centralize the control of it. Uh, here you have Radio Free Maine. <laughs> Radio Free Maine is down here in New York. Uh, and uh, uh, almost wherever I go in the country, Radio Free Maine is there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know, the, uh, bringing the tapes of Noam Chomsky to uh, people who may have vaguely heard of Noam Chomsky. That was Howard Zinn speaking on the media on February 13, 1995, at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. Hi, this is Roger Leisner for Radio Free Maine, and Radio Free Maine presents Noam Chomsky speaking on media censorship and our right to know. A benefit talk held on November 7, 1995 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Organized by Chuck Yu of No Censorship Radio located at WMBR. We now join Noam Chomsky as he speaks on media censorship and our right to know. Well, the uh, obvious way to start a talk on uh, democracy and the right to know is perhaps to try to find the least controversial comment that you can dig up about it. And the best I could do was a letter by James Madison toward the end of his life, uh, around 1822, when he says that a popular government without popular information or the means for acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, uh, or perhaps both. Well, that sounds fair enough, and one might ask who could disagree with that. Uh, there are people, for example, James Madison, uh, not in so many words, uh, but in principle. And that contradiction tells us quite a lot about American democracy and about the media. Uh, James Madison, as you know, was the leading, the, the leading figure in the framing of the Constitution. Uh, and in the debates leading to the uh, uh, the, con the Constitutional Convention debates, he emphasized uh, that democracy is a problem. It's a threat to be overcome, and the new government has to be designed uh, to uh, bar that threat. Uh, the reason democracy is a threat, he stressed, is because the primary responsibility of government, I'm quoting, is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, and plainly, if democracy functions, that's going to be hard to do, in fact, impossible to do, uh, so he argued uh, forcefully and, in fact, persuasively uh, and uh, in the Constitutional Convention of 1787 that view uh, achieved the virtually unanimous agreement of the framers of the Constitution. There was actually only one exception. Uh, and so the uh, system was designed to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority and to ensure that there would be no threat of democracy. The ways in which this has been done are or should be well known. Uh, there have been many changes over the past couple of centuries, uh, but uh, that principle remains pretty much in force, and it has a consequence. Uh, the consequence is that there is no right to know. Uh, rather, there is a need to control and manage opinion, uh, because that's the only way to guarantee that the uh, uh, mi uh, minority, the opulent, will be protected from the majority who otherwise might act in their own interest, and that's unacceptable. Well, there's a lot more to say about that, but let's move right on to the 20th century. Uh, by that time, a lot had changed. One thing that had changed was that uh, extensive popular struggles and resistance had quite considerably extended the scope of democracy. Uh, one reflection of that is the extension of the franchise, and there are many others. Uh, however, while this was going on, uh, something else was happening, namely uh, actual decision-making power was being more and more concentrated. In fact, it was being concentrated in uh, corporate institutions that are totalitarian in essence and were designed to protect power, protect the minority, the opulent, from market discipline, a large part of their point, 
Uh, and they were also being, by the early 20th century, being granted extraordinary powers by courts and by government, uh, which had become more than ever uh, the shadow cast by business over society, to borrow the phrase of John Dewey, a truism that uh, simply echoed and uh, restated in the mid-20th century, uh, points that had been made by many pre-capitalist and anti-capitalist thinkers, Adam Smith, many others, including, incidentally, James Madison, uh, who, uh, which again reveals some of the contradictions, uh, a few years after the system that he had designed was in place, uh, he was appalled by the outcome, and he condemned what he called the daring depravity of the times as the rising business classes, contrary to his expectation, uh, used their power uh, to become what he called the tools and tyrants of government, uh, overwhelming it with their power and combinations and benefiting from its largesses. Uh, take away the poetic rhetoric, and it's a pretty good description of everything that holds right up till today. In fact, it's, today's Congress is one of the most dramatic examples of that that uh, American history reveals, not the first one, but the dramatic one. Well, uh, what was happening in the 20th century was captured rather neatly by Alex Carey. He's an Australian social scientist uh, who actually pioneered the study of corporate propaganda, business propaganda. Uh, that's a huge force in modern life. It extends from the commercial media uh, to the huge entertainment industry, to the enormous public relations industry, to advertising, schools, universities, in fact, but every aspect of modern life on quite a remarkable scale. Uh, and uh, fortunately for us, its leaders tell us what they're up to. Uh, they are engaged in what they call the everlasting battle for the minds of men uh, who have to be indoctrinated with the capitalist story. It's just standard sample from leaders of the public relations industry talking to each other, of course. Uh, and that position is correct uh, on the uh, principle on which the country was founded, if the minority of the opulent are to be protected against the minority, the majority, and if the threat of democracy is to be deterred somehow, uh, then this is really the only way. Uh, force isn't available and at an appropriate level, and even if it were, uh, control over opinion is the fundamental means for ensuring that people accept rule, whether it's a military society or a totalitarian society or a a free society, more or less free society. Again, that's a truism that goes back to the same years, to David Hume's principles of government, in fact. Uh, so all that hangs together. Uh, Carey, describing the 20th century, points out that the 20th century has been characterized by three developments of great political importance, the growth of democracy, the growth of corporate power, and the growth of corporate propaganda as a means of protecting corporate power against democracy. That's a pretty accurate summary, I think, and he gives a lot of evidence to back it up. Uh, and we might simply add that the idea of uh, constructing what he calls a propaganda-managed democracy uh, is not only fully in accord with the principles on which the country was founded, but also with the thinking of uh, leading intellectuals, progressive intellectuals, you know, Wilsonian thinkers, uh, academic scholars, and so on, uh, right through the 20th century, in fact, right up till the present. Uh, uh, the uh, founder of one, of one of the real founders of contemporary political science, Harold Laswell, uh, argued that uh, uh, we should not succumb to what he called democratic dogmatisms about men being the best uh, judges of their own interests. They are not. Uh, in fact, because of the stupidity of the average man, we have to make sure that they don't try to exercise their, uh, uh, their technical options in a democratic arena. Rather, we, the smart guys, have to do it for them. And that's just for their own benefit, that any slaveholder would understand the logic. And it's familiar, in fact. The uh, dean of modern American journalism, Walter Lippmann, one of the leading and most respected public intellectuals of the 20th century, and a Wilsonian progressive, uh, he explained that in a democracy, the general population uh, what he called the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders uh, have to be kept out of trouble. In a democracy, they can be spectators, he said, but not participants. Uh, rather, they have to be marginalized and dispersed so that uh, the bewildered herd, as he referred to the general public, uh, will not interfere with the work of the responsible men, people like him. Uh, like others who have 
advocated these uh, elevated ideas, uh, he politely and wisely refrained from asking why he is among the responsible men, but not, say, Eugene Debs, who, in fact, was in jail. Uh, but uh, the answer is not too hard to figure out, so I'll leave it as exercise for the reader. Well, there's a lot more to say about all these things, but uh, the most important fact, I think, uh, is that the basic principles have not really received a very substantial challenge. In fact, they get reiterated over and over in one or another form, often publicly and overtly, as in the examples I gave, other, more significantly in, in, in actual practice. Uh, the basic principle is that the uh, democracy is a threat, uh, has to be stopped somehow. You can have democratic forms, but you have to make sure they don't function uh, in such a way as to threaten the minority of the opulent and their power. Uh, and that means that the bewildered herd has to be kept that way. Uh, and furthermore, though it's true that this is, in Madison's terms, a prologue to a farce or a tragedy under the cynical name of popular democracy, nevertheless, that's the ideal. Uh, it's the ideal that must be sought. There's no right to know. There is a right to manage, and indeed a duty to manage uh, the minds of men if we are to carry out successfully this everlasting battle uh, to ensure that we control what they think uh, and keep them out of trouble, out of the political arena, separated from one another, uh, lacking exactly the capacities that Howard Zinn was talking about in those introductory remarks. Uh, well, uh, there are, of course, Conflicting values, uh, that's a very important fact. Uh, and the, uh, these are expressed, for example, in Madison's letter, and you find them running all the way through to the present. And the conflict between these conflicting values, uh, that's been a central theme in the vicissitudes of democracy over the past several centuries, and it remains so. Well, let's descend from this high plane of abstraction and come down to practice. Uh, actual practice in the doctrinal institutions of which uh, the media are the ones most commonly discussed, but that's only because they're the most visible component and the easiest one to discuss. I think what you find in analysis of the media is rather general throughout the doctrinal system, journals of opinion, uh, schools, universities, and so on, some variation, but the major themes don't seem to me at least to vary very much. Uh, there's a lot, amount of, uh, a lot of material on this topic in print, uh, including studies that are about as carefully controlled as the empirical conditions allow, uh, in my view, these uh, studies demonstrate fairly persuasively that there is a systematic, uh, sustained, and dedicated commitment to, uh, uh, to retain, to entrench the tragic farce of popular government without popular information uh, that you can figure out for yourselves. There's lots of material to look at, and I won't try to review it. It would be impossible anyway, and a waste of time, because you can do it better on your own if you're interested. Uh, so instead of trying to summarize what's available, uh, let's just take a few samples. Uh, I've been asked to talk about this topic for many, many years, and I've always found that the best way to proceed, uh, and the one that eliminates the legitimate charge of selectivity and examples as much as possible is to just take whatever the lead story is in the, last, in the pre preceding several days. That usually works quite well. Uh, uh, and you know, it's not a total sample, but at least kind of a fair sample if you only have a few minutes. So let's take that one. Uh, here there's no question. It's, uh, you don't have to worry about what the biggest story is. You don't have to count words. There has been one overwhelmingly dominant story for the last few days, uh, the assassination of Israel's Prime Minister Rabin. That's a central topic in U.S. foreign policy and ideology and power and so on. Uh, and there's a leading question. The question is raised over and over again. Uh, will the assassination throw a wrench in the peace process? So let's have a look at that. Well, actually, I remember just to stress that I'm not really interested here in the current history, in the specifics of the current history, but rather in another question, uh, namely how they are presented, uh, how they're framed, uh, how they're shaped. Uh, and what all this tells us about the everlasting battle uh, for the minds of men and how it's waged. Well, when you look at a question like that, there's three types, actually three types of questions you want to think about. Uh, one is questions of fact, how the facts presented. Second is questions of interpretation, like what do people say about them. Uh, but a third and usually far more interesting question uh, is what are the presuppositions? That is, what is unexpressed? 
you know, what is the framework of discussion? What are the assumptions, the premises that bound the thinking uh, uh, that you're not supposed to subject to reflection or discussion, uh, but that the t but set, set the questions that can be asked in the ways you're allowed to look at them. That's almost always the most interesting and important aspect of any doctrinal system, in case any of you are planning a future in any of these areas, uh, that's the way to wage the everlasting battle for the minds of men. Set the presuppositions and you've won the game. Uh, so, for, for example, in the old Soviet Union, uh, if uh, debate, say, over uh, uh, the invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia or, or Afghanistan uh, could be restricted to the question of whether the Russians acted wisely uh, or made mistakes uh, in their defense of Czechoslovakia and Afghanistan against terrorists and subversion. If that was the question, the game was over, and it didn't matter if you concluded that they made plenty of mistakes. Uh, similarly, in, say, Hitler Germany, uh, to go to the extreme, uh, if the debate could be limited to the question of whether uh, the Jews were indeed as much of a threat to uh, civilized values as it was claimed, or whether it was exaggerated, the game was over. It didn't matter what conclusion you drew. And that holds quite general. Uh, often it's reflected in very terminology in which uh, issues are posed. So the first question to look at, if you want to look at a doctrinal system, is just ask about how the questions are posed, what's, what are the premises, what's beyond discussion, uh, what's the terminology that's used, and so on. That usually pretty much finishes the story, whether people happen to tell the truth or not. So let's take the fundamental question again. Uh, will the assassination throw a wrench in the peace process? Well, peace process is a good thing. Everybody's in favor of peace, so therefore we're in favor of the peace process. And we hope it won't throw a wrench in it. And the answer to the question, I mean, the basic choice set of answers is already given. Uh, we all hope that it won't throw a wrench in the peace process, and maybe it will, and so on. That's the framework. So, what this, so the next question we look at, you know, kind of taking this external Martian view, uh, is what is the peace process? What does it mean? What's the meaning of the term? Well, you know, it could mean uh, the effort to reach peace, but it certainly doesn't mean that. And in fact, really couldn't mean that if you think about it. For a very simple reason, everyone wants peace. So Hitler wanted peace. You know, Saddam Hussein wants peace. Everybody wants peace on their own terms. Uh, so, the, so to say you want peace is completely meaningless. Sure, Genghis Khan would be delighted with peace as long as it's on his terms. Uh, so therefore, that's not a serious proposal. Uh, we have to ask, a little, look a little more closely to see what counts as a peace process. Well, within the U.S. doctrinal system, which incidentally has remarkable power around the world, it's quite an interesting fact in itself. Uh, within that doctrinal system, the term peace process has a very clear and specific meaning. It refers to whatever the U.S. government happens to be doing, uh, very often blocking efforts to achieve peace. Uh, that, incidentally, is quite easy to show, and there's plenty of evidence for it in print and a whole variety of areas. Uh, and uh, uh, it, that's a usage that has lots of useful consequences. So, for example, take the phrase, the U.S. government is working to advance the peace process. Well, that turns out to be true by definition, uh, whatever the facts, which is kind of one nice outcome. Uh, take the phrase, the U.S. government is trying to undermine the peace process. Well, that's meaningless. Uh, it's all contradictory or meaningless, uh, hence unthinkable, uh, even if it's plainly true, uh, as indeed it often is, uh, when you understand the peace process as the effort to achieve peace. Well, that's if you can entrench usages like that and not even get people to think about them, the game is over, uh, as in the case of the examples uh, I mentioned. Uh, and in fact, the peace process in the Middle East happens to be an extraordinarily dramatic example of this, uh, of the way the, a really well-oiled propaganda system works. Uh, so let's begin with a couple of just plain factual observations, which are incidentally totally uncontroversial, uh, though unthinkable. Uh, the, and you can check them out and hope you will. Uh, facts of the matter are that uh, for since about 1970, the United States has stood virtually alone in the international arena in blocking diplomatic efforts to uh, bring about a negotiated settlement to the Arab-Israeli conflict through peaceful means. Uh, that's evident, for example, from vetoes of Security Council resolutions, from solitary votes uh, annually at the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, efforts, uh, successful efforts, of course, to block initiatives from Europe, from the non-aligned countries, from uh, the Arab states, from the PLO over many years. Uh, all of this has been the case since 1971, uh, when the United States made a fateful decision, Henry Kissinger made a decision, uh, 
uh, namely to reverse its own policy, uh, uh, which had just been accepted by President Sadat of Egypt, who had offered a peace treaty under UN, or UN negotiator, had offered a full peace treaty to Israel uh, in exactly the terms of official US policy, uh, incidentally with nothing about the Palestinians. It was totally a rejectionist position, but uh, happened to be exactly US policy at the time. The US had to make a decision uh, and decided to reject it. Israel also did. Now, all of this is known. So, for example, take the memoirs of Yitzhak Rabin, who was just assassinated, who was then uh, Israel ambassador in Washington. Well, in his memoirs, he describes Sadat's 1971 offer as a famous milestone on the path to peace. Uh, although Israel had to reject it, he said, uh, as indeed it did. Uh, well, what about in the United States? Well, in the United States, the famous milestone does not exist. The events did not happen. Uh, you cannot find a reference to them in the media. In fact, they're even suppressed in most of the scholarship, including the most recent scholarship. They surely don't constitute any part of the peace process. Well, uh, actually, think about it. That's true by definition. Since the U.S. blocked uh, that initiative, that is, blocked the acceptance of its own official program, that can't be part of the peace process, not in the, uh, in the, in the operative meaning of the term, and so it is excluded. Uh, and indeed, the same is true of the entire record from 1971 up till 1991. It's completely down the memory hole, uh, unmentionable, unthinkable, and also uncontroversial. Uh, and not very hard to find out about if you choose to go to the margins or to the original documents. Uh, that's a real tribute to an intellectual class of which we are part, uh, an intellectual class that chooses, and remember, it is, of course, a choice, uh, to subordinate itself to power. See, the media, that's the easiest way to see it, but it's misleading because it's across the board. As I said, you find the same thing even in scholarship. Well, again, the facts are readily available in print if you're interested, but at the margins, uh, in books and articles that are also unmentionable, though they're around, uh, and, and best of all, in the original documents, which aren't that hard to find and are footnoted in places where it tells you where to look. Uh, well, uh, since uh, U.S. obstruction of the peace process is self-contradictory, given the operative meaning of the term, and hence unthinkable, uh, you don't have to proceed to ask the next question, uh, which is why the United States has so consistently uh, and energetically uh, undermined the peace process since 1971, since the idea is unthinkable, the reasons for it are unaskable. Uh, but if we break the rules, we can quickly find them. Uh, there are three basic issues that uh, have led the United States to block every initiative from around the world, whether in the UN or elsewhere, uh, to achieve a negotiated settlement. One reason is that the international consensus, which I stress again, was virtually universal. I mean, very, you know, very little deviation from this. Uh, the international consensus called for Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories, territories occupied in 1967, and that indeed was US, the US position too, up until 1971, uh, when Kissinger shifted it. But since 1971, the U.S. has taken a different position in international isolation with Israel, uh, namely that there should be only partial withdrawal as determined unilaterally by the United States and Israel, uh, according to their decisions and interests. So that's U.S. policy, and the rest of the world had a different policy, so therefore it was necessary to block every initiative, as indeed was done. A uh, second issue arose around the mid-'70s, uh, and at that point, the international consensus for the first time began to call, began shifted away from rejectionism to acceptance of the principle that there were two national groups that were calling for national self-determination. Is Israel reflected the interests of one, and then there was the indigenous population, the Palestinians. Uh, so since the mid-1970s, the same international consensus, with again near unanimity, uh, has called for uh, recognition of the national rights of the indigenous population alongside of Israel. And the U.S. is adamantly opposed to that and remains so. Uh, so the United States has, in fact, led the rejectionist rejection front, the rejectionist camp, uh, as we would be allowed to say if we were allowed to use the word rejectionist in a non-racist fashion. But that, of course, is also not allowed. Uh, the third basic point, which is less familiar, these ought to be familiar, though unfortunately not. The third point would be harder to find out about, but it's been a crucial one, uh, is that the international consensus uh, recognizes, I'm quoting now, the right of people to resist racist and colonialist regimes and foreign military occupation. Uh, that position is unanimous, except for the United States and Israel, uh, which voted alone 
uh, at the UN a couple of years ago against the major UN resolution on terrorism. Terrorism is supposed to be something we're all, you know, real excited about. And the UN passed a ma one major resolution, the General Assembly, the Security Council couldn't because there the US vetoes everything. But the General Assembly passed a major resolution condemning terrorism in all its forms, very strongly and so on. Uh, the US and Israel alone voted against it. One country only abstained, Honduras. So that's unanimous, essentially. I don't know, they probably had a stomachache that day or something. But in any event, that's a universal view outside of the United States and Israel, which refused to condemn, join the condemnation of terrorism because it, it uh, included the passage that I just described. Now, actually, if you think back, this was around 1987, uh, what, what they had in mind, actually, was, the, was, was South Africa, probably. Uh, they, there, that's probably the main thing that they had in mind, and the U.S. and Israel refused alone to uh, accept the right of resistance against the racist and colonial regime or foreign military occupation, uh, and hence, and that third issue also remains. And so anyway, that's why uh, what is called terrorism here, quite commonly, if you look, happens to be legitimate resistance, uh, according to the international consensus accepted outside the United States. Uh, we're thinking about it when you read about it or you listen to President Clinton uh, uh, declaring uh, that we must battle against this great plague of the modern age, as he did at the UN the other day. Well, uh, all of that, again, is easily established. Uh, facts are there. Uh, you can find them if you like. Also unmentionable and unthinkable. Uh, so putting this together, we discover that the peace process, the phrase peace process, refers to various U.S. efforts to block any form of political settlement that includes these three principles. Uh, and in fact, what it actually refers to is the various U.S. initiatives that have been undertaken unilaterally to achieve its own rejectionist goals uh, in violation of the international consensus. Well, it happens that, uh, for reasons there's no time to go into, we'll talk about it later if you like, but it, it happened. Uh, it happened in September 1993 in the Oslo Accords, which in fact accept precisely the U.S. rejectionist position, virtually without deviation. Uh, it was all just uh, uh, reaffirmed in Washington a couple of days ago, September 28th, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on September 28th, there was a signing of what's called Oslo II, the updating of the Oslo Agreements in Washington. Boston Globe headline called it a day of awe, uh, which is which is pretty typical and fair enough in a way. It was. Uh, quite an impressive power play and a very striking demonstration of the uh, rule of force in international affairs and the rule of propaganda uh, in domestic in domestic affairs, at least in well-disciplined societies like ours. And I should stress that this is worldwide. Uh, it's amazing to see how broad it is around the world. I can give you some examples if you'd like to give you one example. Uh, on Monday, I was, uh, just this Monday, I was being interviewed by outside the United States, of course, and one interview was by the leading, uh, the leading journal in Brazil, you know, the leading journal, and tried to talk about some of this stuff, and the interviewer couldn't understand what I was saying, because to them, peace process means what it means in the United States. Uh, and uh, I pointed out that Brazil's own position had been exactly the contrary, and that has all been forgotten. If you look at Britain, I haven't read much of the continental press yet, but if you look at the British press, pretty much the same, not entirely, but the leading press picks, takes exactly the same framework. This is a level of cultural dominance, which is pretty astonishing. And this is by no means the only issue of it. It's an important fact, as I said. Well, uh, that was the first question. Or, you know, obviously I didn't finish it. But there's an example of what you find when you look at the most important question, the question of presuppositions and what lies behind them and what they're excluding. Uh, let's put that one aside for the moment and turn next to the simple question of presentation of fact. How's that work? Well, here's a sort of a sample pretty typical from lead, you know, lead stories in the last couple of days. Uh, there's a chronology which has been reprinted all over, all over here in Boston Globe and the international press and so on. And it refers to, of course, September 28, 1995, the day of awe. And here's what it says. Uh, at Oslo II on the day of awe in Washington, Israel and the PLO signed an agreement extending Palestinian rule to most of the West Bank. Okay, so file that away for a moment. Uh, take the lead story in the New York Times. Uh, it says, uh, after the assassination, it says Yitzhak Rabin conquered the ancient lands of the West Bank and later negotiated the accord to eventually cede Israeli control of them to the Palestinians. Uh, next one was the major think piece that uh, the Times ran by its leading Middle East correspondent, uh, November 6th. 
Uh, he says that he describes his personal relations with Rabin over the years. He says, Rabin's ideas about peace with the Palestinians underwent a remarkable transformation. It's astonishing how far he had roamed from where he stood in 1992. Uh, so there's third one to take a look at. Well, that, that's typical. Let's just have a look at them. There's three. These are the three major themes reiterated over and over. Is there any truth to them? Well, that's checkable. Uh, so uh, have a look at uh, Oslo too. Have a look at the facts. The map, you can find the maps. Uh, uh, under, according to the maps, Israel keeps total control of two-thirds of the West Bank and effective control of virtually all the rest. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, all but 3%, according to uh, uh, high Israeli officials. Uh, in the 67%, it's total control, everything. In the rest, aside from the 3%, uh, it's uh, Israeli military control uh, with local Palestinian administration, subject, however, to an Israeli veto uh, on any decision that they decide to block. Uh, so that's, uh, 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 go back to the uh, claim, uh, Israel and the PLO signed an agreement extending Palestinian rule to most of the West Bank, in fact, to 3% of it, uh, or you know, around 30% if you include the partial control to administer under essentially foreign rule. Uh, what was ceded to Palestinian rule was a half a dozen towns, uh, areas of heavy Palestinian population concentration, as I said, about 3% of the West Bank, according to high Israeli officials. Uh, and incidentally, these are areas that Israel has always wanted to get rid of, uh, as has the United States urged them to get rid of them, uh, because it's just too costly. Uh, if uh, the New York City administration could figure out a way not to, to cede the South Bronx to its local inhabitants uh, and keep like Wall Street and the suburbs and everything else in Upper Manhattan, I'm sure they would do it in an instant. Uh, and for the same reason, uh, Israel has always tried, been trying to figure out a way to cede control of the uh, heavy population concentrations, which are costly and which we would much rather have uh, run and controlled by local security forces who are pretty much working with it, as indeed is the standard colonial model. Uh, so, for example, it's the way the British ran India, it's the way South Africa and Rhodesia ran the black areas and so on. They didn't have to do it themselves. You get local security forces to do it for you. That's, in effect, the way the United States runs Central America. We happen to call them armies, but, uh, in fact, the way you run it is have local thugs take care of things, uh, and you pay them off and train them and arm them and so on. If everything gets out of control, you know, well, big guy's got to move in. Uh, but this is the standard colonial model, and finally, Israel managed to achieve it. Uh, after giving up this costly uh, uh, direct control, which they've never wanted, but just couldn't figure out a way to get out of. So that's uh, uh, what happened uh, in Oslo II, the day of awe, as far as point number one is concerned. Well, uh, what about the Times analysis, the agreement for event? Argue about what's in people's minds, but the documents suggest absolutely nothing of the sort. They indicate no agreement to cede anything except what Israel and the U.S beside the seed on their own reasons. Uh, there is no, nothing there that suggests any intent to withdraw and certainly any need to withdraw. Uh, so if Israel, if the U.S. pays Israel as it is now doing to continue, uh, meaning your tax dollars and mine, to continue settlement and development in the occupied territory and anywhere it feels like, nobody can claim that Israel is violating the agreements. They are not. Uh, the agreements do not bar that in any way. Uh, and the uh, if there's an intent to withdraw, it's in somebody's head. It's certainly not on paper, and Israel signed no such agreement. Uh, the, uh, let's turn to the third point, the remarkable transition uh, uh, in uh, uh, Rabin's, uh, the astonishing uh, change of how far he'd grown from where he stood in 1992, his remarkable transformation, etc. Well, that you can check, too. The public figure, he says what he believes. Uh, and indeed, there has been a transformation. Uh, prior to 1993, Rabin had consistently held what has been the Labor Party position going back to around 1968, namely that Israel should maintain control of about 40% of the West Bank, namely the usual parts that a lot of parts didn't want. Uh, uh, and uh, that's certainly changed. Now it has 67% total control and 97% effective control, so there's been a remarkable transformation, uh, but not quite in the direction described. Uh, well, um, the important thing to look at if you want to figure out what's going on, of course, is the facts on the ground that determines the shape of a future settlement, as everybody knows, and including the people, the correspondents who wrote these things who have indeed reported on it. 
and in fact, as they themselves have reported, uh, settlement and uh, infrastructure development uh, substantially paid by U.S. tax dollars, uh, either directly or indirectly, in various ways. Uh, that has continued, indeed increased, since uh, uh, the Oslo Agreement, and it's a, a very clear form, not very obscure. The Israeli press is very honest and accurate in describing what's happening, uh, and you get Sometimes it's reported here too. Uh, what's happening is the implementation of uh, what was called the Sharon Plan of uh, 1981, reiterated in a slightly different form in 1992. Now, within the spectrum of Israeli politics, there have been very various proposals about what to do with occupied territories, and this is the most extreme hawkish proposal, uh, which was proposed under the Begin government in 1980 one by Ariel Sharon, as I say, reiterated in 1992, and that's what's being implemented far right of the political spectrum. Uh, it, it's basically a, a, a program aiming at cantonization, that's what it's, it's called there, in fact, break the region into separated cantons, uh, which will be encircled by uh, huge road systems uh, and kept the way out of sight, and people can survive there somehow if they like, uh, and in the, of course, under ultimately local administration, so I assume that Israel will relinquish more than the 97% it now has. Everybody says this has pointed out in the in major journal that this is kind of like the system that South Africa imposed in the 1950s. It's not like the end of apartheid, it's like the beginning of it, uh, with separated Bantu stands established, uh, which you'll recall were called states. Uh, not many people recognize them, but South Africa called them states, and it's entirely possible that this region will someday be called a state, uh, if Israel, as I rather suspect, uh, returns to its standard position, U.S. and Israel, because they work together on this, uh, and moves back to, say, half the territory or something on that order, uh, which would be only rational from their point of view, even on the most extreme rejectionist assumptions, that will then be described as a major and agonizing compromise, and we'll all have to you know, wail about how much how hard it is to give it up, that is to go back to the position that they've had been advocating uh, for 20 years and have been able to maintain 25 years, almost well, almost 30 years now, and have been able to maintain with U.S. support. Well, again, that's uh, uh, impressive. Uh, all of the factual claims, of which I gave three, but they're typical. All the factual claims are utterly false. False. There isn't any question about this. Uh, they are also going to pass without any meaningful criticism. Uh, that you can check yourself in the next couple of days and just see how much meaningful criticism there is of these outrageously false statements. Uh, I think it's a fair prediction. Uh, facts are uh, that Israel most definitely has not withdrawn from most of the occupied territories. It has not signed any agreement or hinted at any intention of signing any agreement to eventually cede the West Bank uh, or even large parts of it. Uh, and as far as the uh, Though, as I say, I suspect the U.S. and Israel will ultimately agree to this for other reasons. Uh, and as far as that remarkable transformation is concerned, yeah, it's a transformation towards extremism. Uh, that's the remarkable transformation, and it's pretty hard to imagine that the author of those lines doesn't know it at some level of consciousness, because he, in fact, Clyde Haberman, has reported a lot of the evidence. Uh, well, that last point about the shift towards extremism, uh, this remarkable transformation, that actually merits a little more closer look and tells us more about what's going on. Uh, so let's go back to the crucial period, 1988. Uh, that's the point at which both the United States and Israel refused to have any dealings whatsoever with any Palestinian organization and recognized no Palestinian rights at all. Uh, and simply, it was also at the peak of the Intifada, the popular uprising, which was put down with considerable brutality. Uh, so let's ask what the position was at that time. You know, extreme rejection is 1988. Well, Rabin was defense minister at the time. And at the time, he called for, as I said, keeping 40% of the West Bank by unilateral Israeli decision, in, con in contrast to the 67% that it held under the Day of Law Agreement, September 28th, and the 97% that it effectively controls, according to Israeli analysis. Well, that year, 1988, has other relevance, which is worth thinking about. So the Boston Globe story on the assassination begins with the following sentence. And so peace has claimed another victim, namely Yitzhak Rabin, who is a martyr for peace, President Clinton said in Jerusalem yesterday. Uh, there's an adjacent story, front page, uh, which discusses the assassination of uh, uh, Anwar Sadat, the former president of Egypt, uh, who became a hero in the United States. So it's worth remembering why. 
he became a hero in the United States because in 1978 he agreed to U.S. terms. His 1971 famous milestone not only didn't make him a hero, but it's out of history because at that point the United States insisted on stalemate, as Henry Kissinger describes it, that is, insistence on no negotiations. I should say there is no secret about this. Kissinger explains carefully why he insisted on stalemate, uh, no negotiations. Uh, well, there are other leaders who have been assassinated but who aren't victims of peace. Uh, in fact, one was assassinated right in 1988, at the time I'm talking about, April 1988. Uh, PLO leader Abu Jihad was assassinated in Tunis by Israeli commandos. Uh, there's no secret about that. They took pride in it. Uh, well, he doesn't enter the pantheon of martyrs for peace. And it's fair to ask why. Well, one argument might be that he's a terror. He was a terrorist, which is in fact absolutely true. Terrible terrorist record. True, but plainly totally irrelevant because that had absolutely nothing to do with why he was assassinated. And furthermore, uh, in the craft of terrorism, he doesn't even come close to the martyrs for peace. That's including uh, our own non-martyrs so far. Uh, the, that's again pretty easy to establish, so that can't have anything to do with the story. Yes, the terrorist, but it's transparently irrelevant. Uh, the second reason why he's not a martyr for peace could be that he opposed the peace process, which is also true in a technical sense. That is, he opposed U.S. rejectionism uh, along with the rest of the world, and therefore he was opposing the peace process as the term is understood here. He did advocate something, but it's not the peace process. Uh, what he advocated was the position that the PLO was then trying to put forward as energetically as it could, uh, negotiations between Israel and Palestinians uh, leading to mutual recognition in some kind of two-state settlement, the exact modality on stalemate, as Henry Kissinger describes it, that is, insistence on no negotiations. I should say there's no secret about this. Kissinger explains carefully why he insisted on stalemate, uh, no negotiations. Uh, well, there are other leaders who've been assassinated but who aren't victims of peace. Uh, in fact, one was assassinated in 1988, at the time I'm talking about, April 1988. Uh, PLO leader Abu Jihad was assassinated in Tunis by Israeli commandos. Uh, there's no secret about that, they took pride in it. Uh, well, he doesn't enter the pantheon of martyrs for peace, and it's fair to ask why. Well, one argument might be that he's a terror. He was a terrorist, which is in fact absolutely true. Terrible terrorist record. True, but plainly totally irrelevant because that had absolutely nothing to do with why he was assassinated. And furthermore, uh, in the craft of terrorism, he doesn't even come close to the martyrs for peace. That's including uh, our own non-martyrs so far. Uh, the, that's, again, pretty easy to establish, so that can't have anything to do with the story. Yes, a terrorist, but it's transparently irrelevant. Uh, the second reason why he's not a martyr for peace could be that he opposed the peace process, which is also true in a technical sense. That is, he opposed U.S. rejectionism uh, along with the rest of the world, and therefore he was opposing the peace process as the term is understood here. He did advocate something, but it's not the peace process. Uh, what he advocated was the position that the PLO was then trying to put forward uh, as energetically as it could, uh, negotiations between Israel and Palestinians uh, leading to mutual recognition in some kind of two-state settlement, the exact modalities to be worked out through negotiation. That's the position that he was advocating, and therefore he was uh, opposing the peace process because the U.S. and Israel were flatly opposed to this, refused to consider it at all. Uh, this had been going on for some years. Now here, the uh, way in which the media and indeed scholarship treat this is quite intriguing. If you look, it's been well documented, not hard to find. Uh, they simply refused to report it. Uh, with, there were some exceptions here and there, but overwhelmingly refused to report it. The New York Times, for example, flatly refused. They would not report uh, PLO initiatives for uh, mutual, for negotiations leading to mutual recognition. In fact, the New York Times refused to print even letters referring to it. Uh, on one occasion, the foreign editor of the New York Times actually wrote a letter to one of the writers, not me, uh, a professor in the Midwest, explaining why it would not print his letter referring to the Arafat offers that the New York Times uh, had refused to print. That's kind of unusual. You know, really let your hair down like that. But it doesn't matter. This is a very well-oiled propaganda system, so you can get away with anything, uh, including total suppression of these facts, uh, and even vast lying about them. The most extreme example of this is by the 
man who was honored for that achievement by getting his second Pulitzer Prize, Thomas Friedman, and quickly elevated the chief foreign correspondent, uh, diplomatic correspondent, his record in lying about this is just as astonishing. Uh, again, you can look it up if you like, uh, but it worked. So that's all out of history. Uh, the uh, official line was then, and remains up till today, that the Palestinians were not willing to consider peace. Uh, therefore, you know, I just had to go on doing the things we were doing. Uh, that was just repeated yesterday in the New York Times story, uh, uh, explaining, you know, running through the history, uh, that at that time the Palestinians refused to uh, consider peace. They were just calling for negotiations leading to mutual recognition and a two-state settlement, and they were refusing to consider peace, meaning what we call peace. Uh, so therefore, obviously, you had to just you know, hit them over the head and break their bones and that sort of thing. Well, facts are pretty straight, but they're irrelevant. Uh, they're irrelevant because they're inconsistent with higher truths that have to be observed. Uh, and in the everlasting battle for the minds of men, you take no quarter. Some things are too important to uh, uh, allow it to be said. Uh, well, uh, let's proceed. Uh, the, uh, and finally, we might ask what the yesterday, the, the vic last victim of peace, Yitzhak Rabin, was doing while his commandos uh, uh, assassinated Abu Jihad in Tunis. Uh, who, remember, was blocking the peace process along with the rest of the world at the time uh, because he didn't accept the U.S. rejectionist position. Uh, well, Rabin was then defense minister, and just at that time, he was or his quotes, he was ordering his troops to attack villages that declared themselves liberated. That was one of the things that was done in the uprising. A village off in a hill somewhere would simply declare itself liberated, uh, and uh, Rabin uh, ordered his troops to attack uh, using uh, plastic bullets uh, first time they were authorized, and the reason he explained was, because, I'm quoting, because our purpose is to increase the number of wounded uh, and to make it clear to the people of the West Bank in Gaza where they live and within which framework so that they'll abandon any illusions of any form of self-government in a village declared liberated somewhere. Uh, well, uh, that was, uh, uh, that's what he was doing. At the time, remember, the U.S. was simply denying, rejecting, uh, uh, pretending that there were no Palestinian off, uh, offers. In the United States, it was easy to get away with that because you know, the New York Times just wouldn't report it. But the world isn't the United States. Uh, and it was uh, by the end of 1988, the United States was in fact becoming an object of international ridicule, public international ridicule, because of the increasingly more desperate efforts to deny the uh, initiatives that had been coming for some years from the Palestinians and were now becoming you know, very hard to suppress. They were suppressed here, but not elsewhere. Uh, so the U.S. entered into a last-ditch effort to try to deflect the Palestinian initiatives. They undertook a dialogue with the PLO uh, in December 1988, and that caused some concern in Israel, but Yitzhak Rabin assured a delegation of Peace Now leaders that it didn't mean anything. It was just a delaying action. Uh, intended to grant Israel a year or more to suppress the Intifada, the uprising, by harsh military and economic pressures uh, so that the peace process could then resort, re revert to U.S.-Israeli rejectionist guidelines, which indeed is exactly what happened. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, there was no objection to this on the part of the Peace Now leaders, at least not reported. So accordingly, uh, Yitzhak Rabin is a victim of peace and Abu Jihad is a terrorist whose assassination we in fact applaud. Uh, as was done. Uh, well, we might ask what Washington's men of peace were saying at that time while deflecting the threat of diplomacy. Uh, the leading man of peace in Washington at that time was surely Secretary of State George Shultz, uh, who explained to New York Times Middle East specialist uh, Elaine Shalino right at that time, in 1988, that he understood the aspirations of the Palestinians, and he gave an example to show it. He said, look, I live in uh, California, he said, and George Bush lives in Texas, and we live in Harmony. So the Palestinians of the occupied territories uh, should have no problem whatsoever living together you know, under whatever arrangements uh, U.S.-Israeli power dictate. Well, that uh, profound insight was blanderded. Uh, it's right there, uh, as always, and it's another contribution to the peace process. Incidentally, Schultz's position on this uh, is completely Jihad, who was assassinated in Malta uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, by Israeli commandos, according to the Israeli press. I don't know if it's true, but they claim that with great pride and applause. Uh, well, if you take uh, Fatih Shikaki's position uh, and you replace Jews and Palestinians, interchange Jews and Palestinians, you have George Shultz's position. They're identical. You know, 
uh, on uh, non-racist assumptions, that is, they're identical, uh, which means that either on non-racist assumptions, either both George Shultz and Patrick Shikaki are men of peace, uh, or else uh, they are both murderous terrorists who deserve their fate, which one of them got and the other one hasn't. Well, fortunately, uh, non-racist assumptions are about as unthinkable as anything else I'm talking about, uh, so we don't have to pursue uh, these exercises any further. Well, maybe this was an unfair example, so try another case. Let's go back to the day before this story broke. Uh, uh, the day before this story broke, there was a front page story on now November 4th. It was about Clinton dedicating a memorial at the Arlington National Cemetery uh, to the memory of the victims of the terrorist bombing of Pan Am 103 uh, uh, over Lockerbie, Scotland. Uh, and the story goes on to explain, I'm quoting now, that the US government charged two Libyans, but Libya refuses to turn them over for trial. The United States then imposed an embargo along with Britain uh, and other sanctions, but some families of the Flight 103 victims have criticized the United Nations and Western allies for not putting enough pressure on Libya. That's the gist of the story, so let's turn to the facts. Fact number one is that Libya did offer to turn the accused over for trial, explicitly and clearly and unambiguously. Namely, it offered to turn the people charged over to an international tribunal, and perhaps at The Hague, you know, the place where the international tribunals are, and they, with a Scottish judge, it's shot down over Scotland, uh, or any other venue, as long as it was independent uh, and neutral. And the US refused that offer, flatly refused, insisting that the people charged, and also refused to give the evidence, that the people charged be turned over to the United States or to Britain. Now that's a demand for which there is absolutely no support in international law, and it's totally senseless. Uh, if Libya, for example, were to demand that Ronald Reagan be handed over to be tried as a war criminal for the bombing of Tripoli and Benghazi, uh, the United States would not say, okay, fine, you know, hand them over to Libya to be tried. Uh, and in fact, there is, no, there is no country in the world that would ever accept this. That's a crazy idea, and as I say, has no support in international law. If you're serious about it, you go to some international, uh, in the relatively independent venue, say the Hague with the Scottish judge. Uh, well, the fact then is, to be precise, that the U.S. is trying to prevent a trial uh, to which Libya has agreed. That is the clear and unambiguous fact. And again, contrary to the news report, the families of the victims are well aware of this. Now, here you have to be a little more careful. There are two organizations of families of victims. There's one in the United States and there's one in Britain. Shot down over Scotland, remember. And there's plenty of victims on both sides and there are two family organizations. Uh, the U.S. family organization accepts the U.S. version, as far as I know, without question. The British family organization rejects it, rejects the U.S. U.K. version. Uh, they protest the fact publicly and very vigorously, protest the fact that the United States and Britain are trying to prevent the trial of Libyans and they even suggest a reason why. Uh, the reason they suggest is that Libya is a scapegoat and an easy punching bag when you want to deflect a real inquiry. Uh, and uh, they also point out the obvious, that if there is a real inquiry at an independent tribunal, uh, namely something which the US and Britain are desperately trying to prevent, uh, if there is a, an inqu a tribunal, uh, it's going to explore the idea about Pan Am 103 that instantly comes to mind. Whether it's right or not, we don't know, but it's certainly the one that instantly comes to mind. And that is that the terrorist bombing of Pan Am 103 was a retaliation for the destruction of Iran Air 655 uh, in July 1988. Uh, the, uh, by, was shot down by the U.S. Vincen, a military uh, vessel in the Gulf, with 290 people killed. And that was a significant event. It's what finally convinced Iran to sort of uh, 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 capitulate to the terms of U.S. ally Saddam Hussein. Uh, well, this has been studied. There are two important studies of this in the U.S. Naval Institute proceedings, uh, which you can read if you like, the most recent one. The first one by a commander of another naval vessel right adjacent to the Vincennes, and the second one by a Marine, retired Marine Colonel uh, David Evans uh, recently. And they point out some interesting things. Uh, these studies, this is the U.S. Naval Institute proceeding. You know, I'm not talking about some marginal rag. Uh, it concludes that the airliner was shot down over, unambiguously over Iranian territorial waters uh, in what was clearly a commercial air corridor. There was no ambiguity about that. They conclude further that the naval inquiry that was held was a complete cover-up for what may have been, they suggest, a deliberate atrocity 
They conclude further that George Bush's testimony at the United Nations was an outright lie throughout, and, quote, uh, our Navy is too dangerous to deploy, uh, in the words of an Army colonel who uh, attended the hearings. Well, uh, Bush proceeded to, uh, George Bush and President, awarded the commander and other officers medals for their achievements, uh, the only real achievement being shooting down this commercial airliner, and he announced uh, publicly, I will never apologize for the United States of America. I don't care what the facts are. <laughs> well, uh, that's plainly a story that's better kept under wraps, uh, here at least, uh, not entirely in Britain. Uh, so under pressure from the families of the victims, uh, a documentary on Pan Am 103, which questions the official version, a documentary by Alan Frankovich, well-known filmmaker, uh, that documentary, Under Pressure from the Families, was shown at the House of Commons in London and was shown over BBC, National Television. Uh, the, I met the head of the British group of families a couple months ago, uh, and he informed me that uh, PBS had refused to run it, uh, of course, commercial television. But in England, it's been shown over BBC and in the House of Commons. Uh, now, the crucial facts about this story, one is it's the United States that's blocking a trial, not Libya. Two, there's an ugly story in the background, uh, which may or may not be related, but is sure to come out if there is a trial, which suggests why the U.S. may be so adamant in objecting to a trial and blocking it. A third point, which what I've come to anybody's mind at once, uh, is that Iran is accused of every terrorist act that takes place anywhere, no matter whether there's any evidence or not, with one striking exception, namely the one for which it very likely is responsible. Uh, namely the bombing of Pan Am 103, which plausibly might be a retaliation for the shooting down of the Iran Air 65, or at least one might imagine. Uh, and that fact is recognized, at least in Britain. Uh, well, uh, a free press would immediately ask some questions about all these things, uh, not simply feature stories that are an insult to the, to the victims, as again is recognized, at least in Britain. Well, uh, these are foreign affairs. What about domestic coverage? Uh, no time. It's late. But if you look, you'll find it's pretty much the same, in my opinion. Uh, there's plenty of material on that, too. Uh, and uh, notice that all of this, I think it's a fairly standard pattern, and it conforms rather well to uh, leading doctrines about democracy and the right to know. So it's not at all surprising. And of course, it's in the interests of those who control the doctrinal system. So it's not a big surprise. Now, of course, it would be absurd to claim that that's all one finds in the commercial or national media. Obviously, that's not true. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, the pattern is pretty significant, uh, as I think you find if you look closely. You don't have to look that closely. Uh, independently of this, there is a tradition in the United States, uh, a very important tradition, of an independent press. Uh, in the mid-19th century, right around here, in fact, uh, in the mill towns and Lowell and Lawrence and so on, uh, there was a very lively and rather substan quite substantial independent press. It was run by artisans, uh, uh, what were called factory girls, young women off the farms who were working in the Lowell Mills and so on. This is you know, the rise of the American industrial system. Uh, they had a, a press that they ran themselves, a interest, very interesting reading, uh, smart, um, thoughtful. Uh, they condemned what they called the new spirit of the age, uh, gain wealth, uh, forgetting all but self. Uh, which they regarded as a degrading and demeaning doctrine that had to be combated. Uh, they condemned what they called the state of servitude to which free people are being reduced by rising industrial capitalism. And they demanded that those who work in the mills ought to own them. Uh, they condemned the destruction of democracy and freedom and uh, culture, in fact, as, the monarch as monarchical principles are being established on democratic soil. Uh, they also denounced what they called the bought priesthood, that is, the intellectuals who serve the masters. Well, the scale of that was quite substantial. In fact, you know, even up to early in this century, it was not very different from the scale of the uh, commercial capitalist press. Uh, uh, and uh, it declined through the 20th century, it though as late as the 1950s, there were still about 800 labor papers around the country, reaching about 20, 30 million people. And they were seeking to combat a huge corporate uh, offensive that was at that time underway to sell uh, sell the people, the American people, on the virtues of big business, as they put it. They also sought, I'm quoting still, to expose, this is the 1950s, to expose racial hatred and all kinds of undemocratic words and deeds to provide antidotes to the worst poisons of the kept press, uh, namely the commercial media, 
which have the task of damning labor at every opportunity while carefully glossing over the sins of the banking and industrial magnates who really control the nation. This is all as American as apple pie, has nothing to do with Marxism or socialism or anything else, goes right back to the origins of American democracy and republicanism. And it's right in the mainstream, I should say, it's at least people are the mainstream. Uh, and all of this indeed is, uh, if you think about it, echoes James Madison's lament about the system that he had constructed as soon as he saw how it was working, that is the daring depravity of the times as business became the tool and tyrant of government. Well, over time, the concentrated power of the private tyrannies has largely eliminated the independent media, uh, and we're now seeing the consequences every day. Well, as always, uh, all throughout this period, there's been plenty of resistance, and that resistance often achieved quite a lot uh, in recent years as well. And as always, there remain endless opportunities to reverse these tendencies. Uh, support for the independent media is one of many, many parts of this task. There are plenty of others. It's obviously not going to happen by itself. That's one thing we can be sure of, and I think we can be pretty confident that if events continue on their present course, the future is going to be bleak. Uh, but if we're honest, we'll recognize that that choice is our own to make. Thanks. I'd like to ask a question that's kind of a large question, I guess, but uh, uh, you were pointing out that organizations uh, that buy for change uh, choose to subordinate themselves to power, and then uh, and the often construct that this manifests what we call respectability, uh, but I was wondering if that choice is an interesting play of words, and I don't, is, what I don't what? Mean, I'm sorry, the choice is what? Is, is that an interesting play of words, but that's mm -hmm. not my question, really, but, uh, and, and I see that, that in its origins, it seems to not be so much a free choice, so much as a reasonable move when groups suddenly understand that federal groups like Cointelpro will not allow them to make broad changes. Thus, it seems like there's only one way taking on the values and mindset of the dominant power. So do you believe that this is a reasonable, a reasonable, reasonable choice? choice. And, and do you believe, do you, is there any history of any group that has not made this sort of compromise in the yeah. U.S.? Yeah, it, every group, in fact. Uh, the U.S. has a very violent labor history totally different from Europe about, in fact, it was so violent, which goes right into the late, in the late 1930s, American workers were getting murdered uh, by private armies and security forces. This just appalled the right-wing press in Europe, but it didn't stop people from organizing the CIO. In fact, I, I hear this all the time. I'm very striking. I travel around the country and the world a lot giving talks, and this is one question I hear in the United States frequently. Freest society in the world. Uh, the, by comparative standards, the society in which the capacity of the state to coerce is less than anywhere else in the world, at least that I know of. And here I constantly hear people say, look, it's a, we just can't face the violence of the state. Well, you know, look, I was take, take the opposite extreme in the hemisphere, Haiti, you know, poorest country in the hemisphere. Well, I was there for a couple of days at the height of the terror, you know, and that was no joke. It wasn't, well, yeah, they had to kill Pro and they killed a couple of people. Uh, that was mass murder, and people were scared out of their wits, and you walked through the streets of the slums, and you could see the terror in people's eyes. But nobody was saying, look, uh, we've got to give up. I mean, you know, maybe somebody in the government might not like us or something like that. Uh, it's only in the United States that you hear this, generally from pretty privileged people, I should say, uh, which is striking. Yes, there's problems, uh, no doubt. I mean, Cointel Pro did exist. Uh, you know, uh, if you were poor, if, you, if, you're, if you're a black organizer in slums, it could, and in one case, exactly one case over 15 years did, uh, lead to a murder set up by the FBI and using the Chicago police. If you were relatively privileged and white, you could get called bad names. It's about what it amounted to. Like I was on Nixon's enemies list, you know. Uh, in fact, there was, I was a friend of mine and I teach a course at MIT were targeted by COINTELPRO. Uh, we discovered this when court cases came along and uh, uh, they uh, you know, had to release documents to people who were targeted. Okay, we were targeted at MIT. It was such an attack that we didn't even know about it. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was an effort to try to disrupt and prevent the political course that we were teaching and various techniques. In fact, it also turned out that the whole incident was fabricated. Nothing happened. It was invented by the FBI office in Boston 
uh, a lot of had a lot of documents up and back from J. Edgar Hoover in Washington, you know, authorizing it and then telling him all the wonderful things they're doing and so on. None of it ever happened. And I presume it's actually asked the FBI defector once what all this kind of stuff is about. And he kind of laughed and he said, "Look, uh, everybody has a caseload, uh, and uh, if, and you have to have like say I don't know 40 people on your caseload or something. Well, you know, you pick somebody from the mafia." not too pleasant, they shoot back and so on. If you pick something like this or you make it up or something, well, then you know, it's kind of convenient life. So, you know, I don't want to say that's all that goes on, but for people in the United States to talk about repression isn't even a joke. I, I would agree with you, but I just wondered um, if would it have, an, have anything to do with people being so socialized, indoctrinated or whatever, and also you, you were in an institution. I know people who've been sure. beat up by oh, the yeah. police uh, yeah. for doing political things. Yeah, watch. I've and and kill places where people like Howard Zinn okay. beat up by the police. Right. Sure. Okay. But that's, and in fact, you know, I was in and out of jail and had my own problems. But all of these are things that people are asking for. You know, it's not uh, like it's it's not that uh, somehow this is repression. It's not very pretty, you know, and sometimes you really do get hurt and so on. But these are people who are, you know, privileged enough, as we all are, uh, to, uh, to, to make use of the very substantial freedom that exists and, of course, face some problems. And depending on who you are, you'll face different kind of problems. But none of them are very severe. I mean, that goes as far as the Black Panthers. They did get a pretty rotten treatment, and a lot were killed. But you know, compared with what happens just about anywhere else, it was pretty mild. Uh, it's true the United States has a violent history, including a violent history of state repression by the standards of Western industrial societies. But uh, remember what those standards are. Uh, you might be quite right that people, in fact, I'm sure you are right, in thinking people are socialized into believing this view. So people here do feel that it's just too dangerous. But if you compare that feeling with the reality that they face, that tells you something else about indo doctrinal systems. You, know? uh, you just compare it with, say, the slums in Port of France. Okay. You mentioned the uh, Lockerbie uh, bombing and how um, the headlines were that Clinton had pledged to get to the bottom of uh, the act of terrorism or bring the terrorism terrorists to justice. On that note, I know the U.S. has had issues with Libya, at least since Gaddafi nationalized the oil fields. And I was wondering, by it making the headlines, uh, which were sort of overshadowed by the assassination headlines this weekend, do you think uh, Libya is again being set up as a scapegoat? Because we all realize that, that the United States has to uh, always have um, enemies or uh, potential military uh, targets. Mm. Well, uh, actually, the story about Libya was the day before the assassination, so I don't want to mislead you into thinking there was a connection. Uh, it was, in fact, the anniversary of the Lockerbie bombing. So those two things are quite independent. But your point is not only right, but you know, well supported. I mean, when the Reagan administration came in, right away, they recognized that they were going to need some enemies. I mean, it didn't take a genius, even in 1981, to realize that what John F. Kennedy called the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that's planning to take over the world uh, was looking a little less uh, dangerous. And it wouldn't be, you know, maybe you didn't know when it was going to disappear, but it's going to be a pretty hard sell. If you wanted to, say, invade Central America, which is what they intended, you're going to have to have some enemies around, real enemies. So right away, instantly, in fact, even before they came in, they announced that the, the major interest of foreign policy would be to defend the United States against international terrorism. And they immediately set up Libya. Right through the 1980s, there were, there were fabricated confrontations with Libya. Uh, invented stories. You know, you may remember it must have been around 1981 or 82. This started in 81, summer of 81. Every single time the press reported, you know, the Libyan danger and atrocity, and then six months later, same press reported in small print, well, you know, it seems to have been a disinformation campaign and so on. But the next time it came around, the same story. There was even one case which was so comical you could hardly keep a straight face. They had tanks surrounding the White House because you know, Libyan hitmen were wandering around uh, going to, remember that? That was like 1981. You know, everybody in the world was laughing hysterically, but here everybody took it seriously. Uh, in fact, every time that a confrontation was set up with Libya, the tourist industry collapsed in Europe, literally, because Americans, this connects with your point about the socialization, Americans were just afraid to travel, you know, because maybe some Arabs would be looking at them somewhere. And this happened over, this is a very frightened society, but it's another effect of the tremendous indoctrination. It is indeed a very frightened society. And these things were just fabricated over and over again. Uh, and consciously, you know, there's one fraud after another. And Libya is a very convenient punching bag. I mean, nobody likes Gaddafi. You know, nobody's going to defend them. You know, a little country, you can't shoot back. Uh, it's just perfect. So yes, it was set up over and over. Uh, I'm sure they, in fact, at the time of the, uh, uh, 
th there certainly have been atrocities. Actually, you can look through uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch reports, and you'll find Libyan terror and atrocities and torture and so on, but, you know, nowhere near our friends. I mean, it doesn't even come close, uh, not to speak of us. But uh, that doesn't matter. This is a well-oiled propaganda system. So your point's right, and I think it's, it's well-documented. But I don't think that's what happened this time. You know, I, and my, my strong, on the Lockerbie bombing, you know, the Pan Am bombing, I suspect that the British families group is on the right track. That the main purpose, at least in preventing an inquiry, the, the main U.S. purpose in preventing any inquiry into it is to try to keep this background story out of sight. Now, whether that's a key to the Lockerbie bombing or not, I don't know. I have no idea. But there's no doubt that any independent inquiry is immediately going to start looking at it. Uh, and even if they don't connect it to the Pan Am 103 bombing, they're going to bring out a lot of things that are better left in the pages of the U.S. Naval Institute proceedings. You know? um, I have two questions about political details of your talk. The first is, I wonder, you, you indicated that the Israeli press is reasonably truth-speaking, and I wonder then why the radical right in Israel hated Rabin so much and wanted him dead as NPR wants to NPR oh, yeah. citizen. That's know. absolutely true. In fact, if you take a look at the United States, and you know, the opposition to him is very strong in the Jewish community. In fact, a good bit of the radical right in, the, in Israel is American. Well, if you know the press is truth speaking in Israel, well, then you know by comparative uh, by comparative standards on this issue, they have a reasonably good record. The Hebrew press. This well, isn't only. I'm not talking about the English language press, which is for American reporters. I'm talking about the Hebrew press, which is secret language for internal use. Well, they, must have, they must have reported, though, that, you know... Oh, the right-wing stuff? Oh, all over the place. In well, fact, you know, I, I get the Hebrew press a couple of weeks late, naturally, so I've just been reading the stuff that was going on in September and so on, and the reports of the hysterical attacks on Rabin and the calls for him to be killed. Actually, this morning in the, this morning in the New York Times, you can read an op-ed by Zev Chaffetz, who's actually an American, who was a press attaché there for years, uh, who calls for uh, uh, doing something to silence the rabbis uh, who have been calling for Rabin's death in Israel. And it's been an open, perfectly open there. But why were they calling for his death if he'd because, from look, 40 percent to 97 percent? Because they want 100 uh, percent. No matter how extreme you are, there's going to be somebody who wants more. If you want to know what people really want, uh, there's two political groupings in Israel, Labour and Likud. Uh, the Likud party, this, its core is Kherut, you know, it's not in Begin's group, goes back to the, you know, you're going to say Lumi and so on, but you know, that's, that's the core of the opposition. Uh, as late as the mid-80s, they had still not renounced their claim to Jordan, and they announced, they stated explicitly that is that they will not renounce Israel's claim to Jordan, namely that that's part of their land, although they won't act right now to realize that claim. Actually, that's also been true of the Labour Party. So the, the kibbutz movement, which is sort of considered the left of the Labour Party, uh, more than half of it is uh, a group with the big, biggest kibbutz movement. Its position was that Israel controls both Jordan as well, though they said, yeah, we don't implement it. Now, I'm not sure. I've never seen anything to indicate whether they've officially abandoned these positions. As far as I know, they haven't. Uh, but uh, there's always somebody who wants more. You know, in fact, if they give up, uh, let's say this, the, the Sharon, who's at the extreme right, you know, in the spectrum, uh, his plan, which is pretty much what's being implemented, gave up a lot. Uh, Menachem Begin, you know, right wing of the spectrum, yeah, he withdrew from the Sinai, his initiative. Uh, so there are people who, you know, within the spectrum, which is not, you know, zero, I mean, it's narrow, but not zero, there are more extremist and less extremist elements, but there are even more extremist elements outside. Um, and I also wanted to know, and this is more general, why is the U.S. so in bed with Israel then? I mean, it so seems what? So in bed. I mean, it hmm. seems like... See, look, Israel performed services. I mean, that's another whole story, and I, wasn't, I, didn't want to look at, I didn't want to look at the history now. But if you look at it, uh, the connect, I mean, it's, it's a, it, 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 there's actually a record on this. Uh, and in fact, um, people argue you know, about what the real reasons are. And here we're in an area of interpretation. But just to give you my own interpretation, and I've given what, it, what I think is a lot of evidence. You can read and figure it out for yourself. Uh, I basically agree with what's called the strategic asset theory. You know, the theory that Israel has been considered a strategic asset. Um, Israel, the United States doesn't care one way or another about Israel. If Israel gets out of line, they'll be down the tube in three seconds like everybody else. 
but the main interest of the United States in the region is control over the uh, uh, oil production. Uh, that has been the main interest since the 1940s, unquestionably. This, no, but don't forget that see, you've got to remember how this works. Here we have to decode the system and look at what is actually said. It said, you know. Uh, it, it's not the Arabs who control the oil. Uh, the U.S. took over from the British a certain way of ensuring that the profits from oil come back to the West and don't go to the people of the region. That's the main issue. Uh, the way of doing it is to set up what the British called an Arab facade, uh, behind which the British would rule. So very weak family dictatorships who are so weak that they'll do whatever you tell them. Uh, and one, the main thing they'll, they'll do is ensure that the enormous wealth of the region does not go to the people of the region, but goes to London and New York and so on. That's, that's a picture that the U.S. just took over the British in the 40s when the U.S. essentially took over the region. Well, there's a problem. Uh, the people of the region are kind of stupid and don't understand why their wealth shouldn't go to them, why it should go to people in you know, London and New York. And since they can't get this simple idea through their heads, uh, you have to have somebody protecting the Arab facade from the domestic populations of the region. Well, that requires force, you know. And the best idea is local gendarmes, regional powers, typically non-Arab, because they can kill Arabs more easily, apparently. So besides, they're usually more efficient because of the history and so on. So you find non-states which will protect the, the, the facade. And there's been a ring of them. Turkey is one, uh, Pakistan has been another, Iran under the Shah was another, uh, uh, Israel was another, and in fact, in 1960s, and in fact, you, you can find this right in the records. You know, back to 1948, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were uh, uh, reporting that they, they were very impressed with Israel's military prowess in 1948, and they describe Israel as uh, a natural base for U.S. power in the region, second only to Turkey at the time, they said. Now, in 1956, Israel got out of line. Uh, they joined with enemies of the United States, namely France and England, uh, in doing something that the United States didn't want at that time, and they got kicked in the face very fast, you know, pushed right out. That wasn't the job. But within a couple of years, got better. Uh, you can read in the National Security Council reports, which are now declassified, uh, that uh, uh, a, a rational a consequence of U.S. opposition to radical Arab nationalism would be to support Israel as the only reliable base for U.S. power in the region. Uh, well, then it goes on. In 1967, with Israel's tremendous victory over Nasser, who they really were worried about, an independent nationalist, uh, the, the alliance gets firmed up very tight uh, because now Israel was recognized as the dominant military force. Uh, furthermore, Israel was pretty much an alliance with the Arab oil oil uh, family dictatorships. Now, you can't show that because those are dictatorships and they don't have documents. Uh, but it's certainly been the assumption of the highest placed American officials. So, for example, Senator uh, Henry Jackson, who was the Senate's leading specialist on the Middle East and on oil for years, and a smart guy, uh, he, uh, back in 1971 or so, he pointed out, I think certainly correctly, that uh, the U.S. strategic framework in the region rested on a tacit alliance between which was a tripartite alliance between Saudi Arabia, the biggest of the Arab you know, oil dictatorships, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Israel. Iran was then under the shock. Now, technically, Saudi Arabia was at war with both Iran and Israel, but that was only technical, and nobody, everybody knew that's nonsense. Uh, in fact, Israel and Iran had a very close relationship. How close it was only came out after the fall of the Shah and only came out in Israel with plenty of documentation. Again, that's not much discussed here. They had a very close alliance. Uh, uh, the U.S. Defense uh, Intelligence Agency has also by now published enough information to back this up. And the picture was, I think, correct. And someday we'll even make it a scholarship that there was a tripartite alliance between uh, the two big military forces, Israel and Iran, and the Shah, remember. Uh, and uh, they were protecting Saudi Arabia. Uh, and all the Gulf principalities against, basically against an indigenous threat. And there were plenty of them. There were about a dozen uh, uh, uprisings in Saudi Arabia in the uh, 60s. And of course, there were pressures from, you know, from the nationalist forces in the region like Egypt. Uh, and so it goes. I mean, when the Shah fell in 1979, it, you could just predict, you know, if you knew what was going on, you predict right off that right away, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel are going to be working with the United States to try to restore the Shah's regime uh, because that would restore the arrangement. That's precisely what happened. It's called here the Iran 
uh, Iran, Iran Gate or something, and you know the whole story about hostages and so on. But that uh, we know that that had nothing to do with it. I mean, the uh, uh, U.S. arms sales to Iran via Israel, funded by Saudi Arabia, began instantly, and there were no hostages. 